Bracken. Kirk. Uh, I don't like when I see ominous usernames with no context when we record. Yep. So, give it to me. Got a little calf something going on. I don't well, know what it is. Like, uh, like going to be fine and can train through or like barking enough where I have to listen to it? Uh, it's going to be fine and I'm also going to listen to it. I started feeling it at the end of a workout last Tuesday. Wednesday, no issues. Thursday did a quality fan bike and row session and by the end of the row it was twinging on me and but all throughout the work section it was fine it was like twinging when i'd stop and then friday i did just an easy day and all day long it ached and as soon as i warmed up to use it it went away um it's good and then saturday i did yeah, Saturday, I, I same thing. I'd be walking and it would like twinge or feel weird, but not necessarily pain. Like almost like a, it wanted to grab like a cramp, but it never did. It was just little blips, and so I warmed up, did a two mile easy or mile easy in the grass, and then did a four mile hard tempo in the grass on like Rudy, divity stuff. Just like let's find out. <laughs> it, it was on my schedule anyways, and that didn't feel a single thing the entire run stopped hit my split and the first walking step i took it started twitching again hmm. and well, ever since then like i'll be laying on the couch and it'll feel it uh, so i haven't felt it during a workout but it's getting more frequent so i just i decided i'm not going to run for a week and i'm just going to lift hard and erg hard a whole week huh see i would say yeah calves always scare me yeah, that lower leg soft tissue stuff is tricky, and it just doesn't go away with the snap of a finger. But it sounds like you still have the green light because when you're using it, it's responding better than anything. I know you're paying now and getting ahead, so I think that's the right answer. It's just For an sure. interesting way it's displaying itself. It is, but it, the, the way it was displaying itself between workouts was starting to escalate. Got it. So I backed off, maybe that was Friday I did that, backed off Saturday, Sunday, and already things are feeling better. So I may not make it a week, but for sure three or four days, not even going to consider a run, and only things that feel safe. Isn't that the best thing about hybrid? Fine. The best thing about hybrid is like if you're a pure runner, which most of you listening are, and right now I will call myself a pure runner, you hurt yourself somewhat and you can't run and it feels like any sort of cross training is just a sort of a waste of time. Don't get me wrong. You need and must do it, but it just feels like, what am I doing? Wheel spinning. You're just counting down the seconds and minutes and hours and days until you can run again. When you're a hybrid athlete, yes. like, okay, I can't run again. Great. I have eight different modalities I can focus on that will still make me better for race day. So it's not as catastrophic when you can't run as a hybrid athlete. So glass half full. Right. It's nice. Yeah. And I, I've i been slow to respond lifting. And so this will be a good week to just overload. Go extremely heavy, struggle on sets, and not worry about it <laughs> impacting my running. There you go. Do you guys have the um, <clears throat> miserable humidity down there right now? It was 90. I went for a recovery run this morning of 12 miles, which is far, but... Um, 97% humidity. When I woke up, every single window in my house is so steamed up. Like if you took a hot steamy shower and fogged mm. up the mirrors, I couldn't see out my house out of any window. It's the stickiest run I think I've been on in, I'm going to say years. It was wild. It's like running in a steam room. You guys got that down there right now? Yeah. Yeah. I went to click on my, I have a weather app that just stays at uh -huh. the top of my phone and it doesn't say the weather it just says heat advisory yeah we have that too and that damn heat advisory and that just heat muggy rolled in just in time for friday night it was like it couldn't have been oh good it was on the precipice of being bad but not so bad that it was obviously going to affect you until you started racing and then i was like oh dang it is so overwhelmingly sticky and hot uh it's like if the race was a day earlier, 12 hours earlier, even if it was in the morning, the conditions would have been pristine. 
and it turned out to be not nearly as hot as previous years, the race I had on Friday, but like very, very sticky. Um, it's just the cards were drawn here. Certainly August. muggier. Yeah, definitely muggier. So um, should we dissect it? What do you want to do here? Yeah, I, I mean, I already Strava stalked you. I stalked their results, and they had good splits on the website. Yeah. So I've I've gone through the race digitally, but I want to hear the breakdown. What did you think of those beautiful positive splits, Bracken? <laughs> Weren't those a thing of beauty? Well, it's never what you want, <laughs> but you were consistent with everything you were doing. You were consistent at 74, and you were consistent above 74. <laughs> yeah, I, I included the splits in my posts, uh because it just shows once the bleeding starts, how aggressive the bleeding can go. You can go from running, I think, 71s to, I don't know, what did I end up hitting there? 77s at some point, 76, not good. It uh, The floodgates opened, we will call it. Um, it was, this, was this stalking just merely Strava data? Uh, no, that there was also a website and I'm forgetting what it was that had the results up with lap by lap splits. Mm. Probably why, why is that a timing? Why is that? Uh, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. One of those. Pods. I wanted to say ways. Yeah, it's close. Not ways. Um, <clears throat> so I know you haven't been to the twilight 5,000 meets, um, before, but this is like a last, they're almost wrapped up for the year, but this would be the last shout out to go check out twilight 5000 meets put on by tracksmith if they have them in your local area they at least have them in the major cities around uh the u.s and actually overseas as well have you looked into the cities i almost want to list them out so people know like how far these races spread let me see yeah each year i look at it and say hey i'm gonna go do that and I don't. <laughs> so let's look here the twice so we don't have one but chicago has one Twilight 5000. So they, I'll just, you know, I'll list them off. There's maybe 15 cities here. Uh, they happen, and they most likely happen in these cities next year as well. So for those of you who are potentially is interested, uh, Melbourne, Australia, Riley, Birmingham, UK, Copenhagen, Oakland, Oklahoma City, London, Mexico City, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Boston, Washington, D.C., Detroit, Los Angeles, Toronto, Vancouver, Oslo, Twin Cities, and London. Again, in London. Those are all the races. I bet a lot of people listening can find their way to one of those cities, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, you can. So, we're really well organized events. As I had anticipated, Kerry Tollefson, fresh off of commentating the Olympics for Peacock, was... All the way down and reduced to commentating the Twilight 5000. Got called uh, up to the big leagues. She did. It had to be quite the uh, disparity between the two. But, she, dude, she killed it. She was, like, singing and dancing and must have been looking up people's bibs and all the heats and cheering for them individually. It was like, if you wanted a hype woman out there for you over the mic, like, Carrie Tollison is your girl. I was very impressed. Carrie, I don't know if you listened, but yeah. you nailed it. Um. So I think the the races are about wrapped up. There might be a few in September somewhere across the world. But look into it next year. Look and see what they have. If they have the 25, uh, 2025 schedule out yet, uh, highly recommend. And you should have done one this year, Bracken. There's no point for me, Kirk. Why is that? I shouldn't say that. But I do not like stepping out onto a track until i know i can compete hard and fast <laughs> i have had f what dozens and dozens of horrible track experiences in my life and there is no place to hide on the track if you are not able to go with the pace you are exposed and miserable and a 5k is especially bad with 12 and a half laps i've run 5ks on the track and blown up i know what's going to happen I don't I don't need that yet. When I'm when I feel confident to race, there's nothing I want to do more than jump on the track. But I haven't had that confidence this year. So I'm not going to do it until I have that. There are times to jump into things. I did not feel that this was the year to jump onto the track. It is true. It's very exposing. I think if you're not if you're not confident in your objective measures of fitness and you know a time that's so raw and you can't hide from is only going to hit the ego and demotivate you. 
I agree. It's probably mm-hmm. the wrong place to step into a race. Um, so to step ahead, so I had, I don't know, a hundred people reach out and either say, go get them or can't wait to hear the recap or sorry, you didn't hit your goal. Can't wait to hear about it as a, as a recap on the, on the podcast. And so I feel like it's a 5k. It took 15 minutes of my life, but I think there's some really good takeaways from this. And we are going to title this episode, stay power is king. And that is my big takeaway from the race. Stay power is king. Stay power is all that matters. Speed is a bunch of malarkey. That's what I think. Stay power, stay power, okay. stay power. Speed is the the flashy hot girl with no personality and there's no substance there and can't back it up. Right? That's what speed is. The shiny thing that has no depth. Stay power has depth. And I don't know, do you think that's too aggressive of a statement? It's very aggressive. Too, do you think it's too aggressive? What do you think of that statement? I want to hear what you think. No. Well, I think two things. I think that I agree wholeheartedly, uh-huh. and I also think people will very easily and quickly look at that and say, yeah, that's easy to say when you have speed. Good point. Ooh, I like that. It's like when people say money doesn't buy happiness. Well, it's easy to say when you have a lot of money. Mm. Money certainly changes, ha- ha- changes happiness really quickly when you're broke. And when you are extremely slow-footed, speed does matter. So I think that that you are preaching to the choir with me, and you are going to have mm-hmm. some people to convince throughout your episode here today. Nah, I still think you, in quote, slow people, speed don't matter. Comparatively. A cake isn't a cake if it only has frosting, Bracken. A cake is required to make it a cake. Some people would argue. <laughs> they would prefer just the frosting. And the cake is the stay power, and the frosting is the speed, but the cake is no cake without the cake. And that's what I think the stay power is. So um, I've never wanted to s- – not. I wouldn't say never. I-, I wanted to step off the track or back off to like a six-minute mile pace more than I have ever have in a race in recent times. Which is bizarre for me. Really? Yes. I was having no fun. I did not enjoy it. When it got real, it got very real. When it got very real that I was not going to run even close to what I wanted to, the internal motivators to continue pressing decreased notably. But I didn't. And I'm proud of it. In fact, I stayed on it. And everything in me was like, what's the point? but that's not the way to lead and it's Mm -hmm. not the way to do things. So I didn't, but I wanted to. It acutely hurt more than anything has hurt in recent times, which I did not expect. I thought I was prepared for it and I wasn't uh, as as far as the sting goes. And it also confirms that a one-off 5K, if you're going to have to nail it, thread the needle, is really a fool's errand without a couple cracks at it or familiarity with the distance and how it feels. And you could say that about any race, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the shorter the race, the more you need to be familiar with it. And so I think I learned that as well. What do you think about that? Okay. Again, surface level, I very much agree. I want to hear some specifics. So do you mind if I lead you for a few minutes and then you take off and run wild and run free? Um, Sure. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. What was your goal pace coming in? Because that's the thing about track. That's why I would jump into a cross-country race and not a track race, because in a cross-country race, you can just jump on a group and be successful by passing people. On the track, the stopwatch, if you have a goal, is what's judging. So what did you come in goal-wise? 448 mile pace, so 72. It's 448 and change, or 449, but... um, Basically, to run 72s or 72 and change per quarter should come out to 15 flat or 14.59. Okay. And A, what did you go out at? And B, how long did that last for? And what was the progression of feeling lap by Mm. lap while you were able to keep it? Uh, 4.46, I think, was mile one. Um, Yes. Okay. Okay. Felt more cost. It was like high four forty six. Okay, felt more costly than I anticipated. Okay. 
I want to preface this with only one excuse, and I'm going to do it, and I rarely do, and then the rest are all facts, okay? Uh, the excuse mm -hmm. is uh, I wasn't feeling my best, and it wasn't a full-blown being sick. It was a I get this sinus stuff, and it's a slow death, and I had was all congested, and stuff wasn't feeling great, and I went on meds starting Wednesday, and the race was on Friday. What I forgot about meds is what it does to jacking my heart rate up and how it makes me feel it. Like you get that bloated, awful feeling in your gut. It was augmenting. It's like a horse pill. And I just was like, I was too close to the race and I was willing to maybe, if I didn't have a race, I would have rode it out and probably not taken meds. But I was, I could tell I was heading the wrong direction with how I was feeling every day. I was starting to get the chills, not sick, sick, just like not well. And so I got meds on Wednesday and started taking them my heart rate just started rising every day. And I should have remembered that it does that because if you don't want your heart rate to rise on you or be a little higher than normal, it's in a 5K with the heat rising uh, you know, throughout the day and then ultimately being pretty hot when the gun went off. And so in hindsight, I should have just rolled the dice and not have done that. I shouldn't have taken meds. I should have been like, Kirk, you've trained not feeling well before. You've raced not feeling well before. You don't need these meds yet. Wait till after the race and clear this thing up. And I didn't. So that was on me. But I think it actually impacted me greatly because I went in with a stomach ache. I was nauseous all day. I was trying to go to the bathroom but couldn't. So I was all bloated. That's the excuse side that I'm going to just shove aside because it doesn't matter. Fitness doesn't care. That'll preface all of this. Is that okay. fair? Um, so what Sorry. did I... Get so it out there. What, so what did I feel, are you saying? You're asking? Yeah, lap one, 41, or uh, 71 seconds. Lap two, 71. How, mm -hmm. what, what, what was your feeling like compared to anticipation? Um, felt, the speed felt effortless. Um, well, what I should have done, Tyler Morey, who uh, is a coach himself, he is North Coast running. I don't know if you listen to this podcast, um, but he was the 15 flat pacer and he was planned to go through 1600 meters to three K ish, depending on how he felt. Well, my stupid butt went out faster. I said, I should just hang on to him, let him do the work. And then when he drops, we'll get to business. Well, I thought I needed to bank time. I went out a little quick. I ended up leading the whole dang, dang group. So I, for like six laps, I ended up, dragging the the chain of people along running just under 15 minute pace so he was behind me the whole time the guy who's set mm -hmm. up to help you run 15 minutes i was in front of and i shouldn't have done that but i fell in line and got into a groove and so it felt effortless at first it was like the legs turned over i was holding myself back i couldn't feel pacing um, but i noticed like my respiration rate was really high even though my legs felt pretty good so that was the initial feeling and how many laps until you started to feel worse than you wanted to? Uh, we came through the mile. I took a quick glance down. I was at like 186 or something heart rate on my watch already. And I could tell coming into it, I could just feel the legs filling up a little bit. So I would mm -hmm. say there's this like awesome line of people on the home stretch. They're basically only give you two lanes. They're on the infield, they're on lane three and out, and there's hundreds of people. You're running through this tunnel and people are just screaming and cheering and the music, it's so intense and loud. And you run through that and you get this resurgence every lap. It's amazing. And it usually mm -hmm. only happens for like the last heat or two. I really encourage you to experience it. You you need to do this. It's actually one of the cooler experiences I've ever had. You remember like running through walls of people and like the cross country state meet or something or like big invitationals and people are just all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's like that, but even more intense because it's no, closed. I didn't make state. You never went to state and cross? Nope. Missed out by one or two tenths my senior year. I got out leaned for the final qualifier spot. Uh, was it uh, when they took five? Yep. Hmm. Uh, they changed that rule when I was older, but I took seventh when they used to take seven 
as a sophomore and was the last mm-hmm. qualifier, and then they changed it, and then I was finally good enough to make the top five. But that's tough. Um, yeah. Mark so, Mitchell, mm. he's out there somewhere, still basking in that glow, out leading me for the final state spot. And Mark, I've never forgiven you. I think he went to point and ran. Came down to a kick and a lean for the last spot. Lean. Yep. That'd be a tough day, huh? Yeah, and we missed uh, as a team by two points. On both accounts, huh? Mm. Just got kicked in the crotch twice. Yeah, you did. That was your senior year? Yep. Ugh. Um... So anyways, about a mile. About a mile in, I was like, this ain't good. I wasn't sure, but I was starting to feel like the the, how hard I had to press to keep pacing. Uh, Stubborn enough Mm -hmm. to know I needed to keep on it, so I started reaching on lap five and six to stay on pace. I'm like, I'm reaching too much. Um, So I think somewhere in there, somewhere lap four or five. Okay. And then what happened? (laughs) And then a slow trickle of... Uh, let's call it in uh, decreased pacing. Just it was a four lap sort of slow regression. You know, seventy twos turned into seventy threes, turned into seventy fours, turned into seventy six. Somehow turned back to seventy fours ish, and then stayed right there. And the effort just kept rising and rising. My heart rate was somewhere around one ninety four. Uh, 192 to 194 for the last two or three laps, which I hadn't seen in forever. And it was, it was everything I could do to just keep my body moving forward. Yeah. It feels like, uh, do you remember Mm -hmm. racing your last 5k when you nailed it? You remember what Mm -hmm. that felt like? What did that feel like? What would be your description? Yeah. Uh, for, I got heavy legged at almost right at the mile, and I spent mm. the next mile convincing myself not to quit because mm. it got worse every single step from one mile to two. And then I got a glimmer of hope, and that little hope gave me one last push. And then it got a little better each stride from like twelve hundred meters to the in the last twelve hundred meters to the finish as hope was reestablished. Without that it would have continued getting worse every single step. That's right. You were chasing a guy down in a road race or something, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I think it, it, it was didn't awful matter. for a long time. Yeah, it is. The 5K, I think, if nailed, might be... Like, if you weigh out, like, okay, a 400 hurts so immensely, right? The sting is so sharp, and when it cuts, it cuts sharply, but it's over quickly. The 800 extends that out a little bit. Some could argue that's the most painful race. But I think you have to factor in the amount of time suffering multiplied by the rating of sting, right? And that's what you can Mm -hmm. formulate the toughest race. And I don't know. The amount of time you have to sit into, like, the heavy discomfort in a 5K is probably higher than any other race I've experienced. Like, if you do that fake equation, it's got to be right up there, if not the highest on the list at least that's my recency bias for me the two most uncomfortable from both intersecting points intensity and duration that i've ever run in my life were the 3k steeple and the 5k the Mm. mile is brutal but you really have to survive one half of one lap Mm-hmm. maybe three quarters of one lap bad and then the kicking starts the 800 yeah. by the time it hurts you're kicking the 10k there's more of a pace to it but the 3k and the 5k to me were the two most brutal events yeah my coach from college is on strava i would actually really like to get him on the podcast uh john zupont uh he's just the best uh anyways what was his comment i'm looking at it <laughs> uh he says and he's got to be in his 80s now. He's still chasing things. I just really respect the man. And so we comment on each other's runs on Strava now, which is just amazing. He was my coach half a lifetime ago, mm-hmm. and we still stay in touch, and he's so encouraging. Uh, the 5K is a long, sustained hurt. It's like the 3K, except you have to hurt for another 2K, exclamation point. It is a tough race to get right. That was his uh, response to my Strava. Mm-hmm. Uh, cannot agree more. Um, and so with that, um, 
so I led this group of guys chasing 15 minutes for six laps, right? And mm -hmm. they clearly had managed their effort better than I had. I, I was in fifth or sixth place in this pretty stacked field leading a train. Spoiler alert, I ended up 10th or 11th. So you can see how this went. I wasn't chasing. I was being hunted and passed pathetically. And so right when my pace started to slow, one went by. And you know what I did at lap six? I surged and said, F you, and I passed him back. And that was a bad decision. <laughs> that was a bad decision. And then the next lap, he goes by me again like I'm a tool bag. And then the next guy slowly but surely goes by me. And the next one catches me on the next lap. And then to put the dagger in it, I get out, kick 10 meters before the finish line in the tunnel of people, <laughs> flailing home. <laughs> oh. Just didn't, you know, the ickies started happening in the last four laps. And that's just what happens when you overextend uh -huh. early. You're smiling. So that's how my race finished, with a, with a fizzle. The only way to run a good 5K is to get on the correct momentum train. In an 800 and a 400 and a mile, you can get out too hard and hang on. I don't believe that works super well in a 5K. At some point, you have to have momentum moving in the right direction <clears throat> towards the second half to be able to close it down, to have full access to a kick, all of that. And you just went in the wrong direction, and then all bets are off. It just gets worse and worse and worse, and you're just stuck in it. Now you have to, you have to pay for your sins, and that's tough. <laughs> it's not rare. I usually pride myself on executing well. Um, so I ran 15.17 was my best last year, so this was nine seconds off. I ran 15.26. I think I could have ran 15.15 on Friday if I executed okay. correctly, right? If I just was conservative early, I think I could have run another maybe 10 seconds faster-ish. I wasn't out there to do that. And so I made my bed and I lied in it, I think, pretty much. Um and what I felt was engine. And again, I was on meds in the heat. It was 76 degrees when it started with 76% humidity. Frickin' Jack Bauer, of course, leave it to Jack to send me this long, unprompted text message. But it was out of support, and it was very nice. So if you can see here, this is out of the blue from Jack. You, you see the amount of stuff on there? Yeah. Does this surprise you at all? No, this is Jack. Jack cares and thus does his research and gives you the information you need to hear. <laughs> Do you want me? I'll read the text to you. And, and maybe this will help some other people because I don't know about you, but I'm hearing a lot of like, you know, heat and humidity stuff sort of impacting sessions, quality sessions or races. Mm -hmm. uh, you're still hearing that, right? I am from athletes. Yep. Yeah. Um, so it says, <laughs> out of the blue at 1130 yesterday, you've got to find a 5K in better weather this fall when temperatures are cooler. That's literally the on only thing preventing you from going sub-15. 75 degrees with 75% humidity equals 65 degrees dew point. So he looked at my Strava, saw what the weather said, and then, you know, did his math. Mm -hmm. The heat adjustment calculator I've always used says to add those degrees together. If it's under 100, then there's virtually no difference in pace due to weather. <clears throat> However, you get a couple percent slower when it's hot and humid, obviously. He sends me a link to this calculator. Your total on that day is 140, so that is a big impact, being 100 is the 100 or below and no effect on your performance. 75 degrees plus 65 degree dew point equals 170. Here's how much heat affects you based on that number. If the number is 135, 2.5% slower. If it's 140, 3% slower, and if it's 145, 3.5% slower. So then he does the math for me. He says, your 1526 at 135 would have been a 1503. Your 1526 at a 140, which is what my race day conditions were, 1458. And if it were a little hotter, 
1526 would have been 1454. So basically, you're in 1454 to 1503 shape, he says, in ideal weather. You are fit enough to do it in better conditions. Out of the blue, Jack Bauer just sends me this rose-tinted glasses, half-glass full text. Isn't that nice of Jack? That's what you need to hear. Do you buy into that? Because you need someone to talk you off a ledge after the finish line like that. Do you buy into it? To an extent, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things where if it's if you buy it 100%, you're just locked into, I can do this right now. Even if you think, well, let's say 50% of that's accurate. Well, I'm still running 1510 that day, 1512 going backwards without motivation. If I'm in 1510 to 1512 performance shape right there, but now I have my teeth in it with a mile to go, suddenly I'm 15-0 again. And now I'm one race away from tidying some things up and sub-15. So whether you believe it fully or partially, it's enough to reframe what that effort meant and keep you dialed. Well, thank you, Jack, for that. Um, And I, I, I just don't know. I don't know because last year it was 90 degrees and 89 degrees for these races. And this year it was 76 perspectively. I was like, no big deal. Are you kidding me? This is so butter compared to last year. Right. So I thought it was going to be a gimme and it wasn't. And so, um, I don't know. And then I asked him, you know, I said, I sent him one back and he said, I set my 800 meter PR two flat 0.03. So three one hundredths of a second off. He said, I set my 800 meter PR 200.03 in 90 degree weather with really high humidity. And it's always bothered me that I could have had a 159 as a PR if the weather was better. You're basically in the same position with waiting for that 14, whatever, in the 5K. So it's a personal vendetta for him to make me feel better about this because I think Jack needs to feel a little better about his 200.03. Just tell him that it doesn't affect uh, short races. <laughs> After he sends me that nice message, just slap him in the face. Yeah. Aren't you recording Race Brain yeah. later today? You can do that yourself. Right after this, actually. Yeah. So just to piggyback well, that, and then I'll, I'll go ahead. You go ahead. I've done enough talking already. Well, I was going to piggyback that. Before we get into the actionable pieces and your takeaways, my takeaway, that aside, my positive takeaway is that we can just sit back and say, how cool is it that a decade after you maybe thought these times were no longer a thing for you, at 41, you can go out hard in hot and humid, crumble back to 76s and recover. Like you can crumble back to 504 pace and then get back down to 456 pace after a couple laps at that. The 506 pace is now a place where I was hating life and I need to shelter myself here running 76 seconds per lap. Yes, it's still hard, but you faded to 504 pace at 41. There has to be some amount of pride that you can take with that and say, I don't know if I would have ever said that about myself. Hmm. Well, thank you for that. The the funny thing is with this is like age doesn't even, that's all I've talked about, right? Is like being a master's athlete and da, da, da. Mm -hmm. I forgot about that completely. And even like acknowledging the fact that running 1526 at 41 and executing poorly and race managing poorly was part of it. I don't know why. Like it wasn't like I looked around. It wasn't like that wasn't part of my equation. So I think I need to hear that perspective because I didn't care about age meant nothing out there. It just was like mm-hmm. 15 flat was it. Um, and I don't know. I hold myself to a higher standard. Like I went, I can be so kind to everybody else about, you know, bad races or poor execution. But truth be told, like I've been on a tear, man. I've nailed, I've done well in most everything I've done lately. And so, I thought I was going to ride this momentum. I had a dream about running 1453 a week and a half ago. Mm-hmm. You know, 1453. I had a dream about it. I was like, I show up and I take care of business. That's what I do. And then I showed up and didn't do that. So point being is age didn't really factor in. Um, it just I was so focused on the mission, the mission at hand. But um, what are you looking up there? Well, I have one more question before you take over. 
Yeah. What, uh, when you were in college, what was your peak fitness for a 5K? What do you well, think never, you could have run? I never raced the 5K. Um, Correct. I, if I were hedging my bets, I would have bet I would have ran 1440 something. Okay. At that time when you did that, that would have been based off 1500 strength, not 5K strength. Right. Could you have gone out too hot and faded to 5.0 and come back from that in college? Or would this have been about the best you could have hoped for? Pooh. My stay power certainly wasn't as good, so I don't know what would... I think that mm -hmm. it would have been a little more aggressive, the fade, unfortunately, then, yeah. So even age aside, you brought something to the table you didn't even have in college. And then I also looked up just for fun, what does 1526 equate to in a half marathon, and it's 11040. Oh. So... Under what I your ran. two results for... Yeah, but what you thought you could run. Hmm that day with just better pacing. So your two results, neither with ideal pacing, one too casual, not too casual, two maybe respectful of your first time at that distance and the other one uh, disrespecting <laughs> the distance in the nicest way possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Both say that, yeah, for the first time maybe in your life, you're 5K and a half marathon a line right now. Shoot. And that's kind of cool. Doesn't feel cool, but it's nice to hear that maybe they track. I did look right. up. But like, that also says that since historically you always get better faster, the shorter the race is, yeah. that you have room to sharpen here. Like you're matching your half marathon. Mm -hmm. You know there's no world in which that's your ceiling. No, that marathon sets your floor. Your 5K will set more of your ceiling. So there's room here. Hmm. Well, thank you for that. It's not even a big deal. Like I'm not even... It doesn't like it doesn't like ruin my day. Like there's enough stuff going on in life. Like I went on uh, with my weekend per usual. Everything's fine. This isn't like a ho hum conversation. It's like I've done this enough, right? Like I've swung and oh, it missed. ruined my day. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, I was genuinely upset for you. I was refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. And then I was like, oh shoot, yeah, well, that sucks for him. I did go out. I intended to go out for a long run on Saturday morning, uh, and we raced about 9.30 at night on Friday, and I set out for a long run, and I hated every step of it the next morning. I wasn't in it. I uh, mm -hmm. I went six miles, <laughs> and I came home, and Jess was like, what are you doing home? I was like, I hate running. I'm done with running right now. And she knew I was being facetious, and I was, and then I said, I'm going to run long run on Sunday. I'm going to do it then. Today's not my, why, what am I thinking doing a long run 12 hours after, not even 10 hours after I raced the 5k. And then I woke up Sunday morning and I said, I don't want to run today. I don't want to run. It's the last thing I want to do today. I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But then this morning I woke up and ran 12 miles and wanted to keep running more. So like, I think I just needed like a slight deload from, from running. Whether or not you PR, it doesn't change the effort it takes to get up for that type of race and lock in and hold yourself to the pace as long as possible. Whether you cross with a PR or whether you fade to the finish, like, that effort is costly. Yeah. And you needed some aftercare. And tell, I'll tell you what. I saw. So I, I took um, Endure Elite. They have the victory caps. I don't have the, um, like the scooped pre-workout, but... You know, I took okay. three victory caps, which are 250 milligrams of caffeine. I took them about 845 at night uh, before I started my warm-up. 250 but, each? No, 250 total between the three caps. So, oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, no, so, so like, I took it as directed, but, um, dude, yeah. I could not. I think I fell asleep at, it had to be almost 4 a.m., 3.30 and then oh, my man. biological clock woke me up at 6.30 on Saturday morning. Like, I felt like death. But holy smokes, taking caffeine at yeah. 9 p.m. at night is not recommended. Have you ever done that, like taking a pre-workout late at night mm -hmm. to get up for a race? What yep. was your response to that? It was the same thing. So the, the two worst times for me were uh, the Tennessee Mile where mm. I had caffeine, the race starts at noon and goes till 6 p.m. So I had caffeine at 11 
and then I had caffeine at 4 p.m. to just give mm-hmm. me a jolt for the second for the last two hours of the race, and I was up and up and up. And then the other, the worst one actually was when I uh, boxed in Alaska because there were three things going on there. First of all, there was as much adrenaline as I've had in my life, so I mm-hmm. was riding that whole wave plus caffeine. Plus the weird thing where the sun doesn't go down that time of year. Oh, gosh. So I, I was up the entire night afterwards just like climbing the walls. When did you fall asleep? It was one of those where I started dozing, drifting in and out, and eventually gave up at like 9 in the morning. Like from like you, 6 to 9, I dozed oh. in and out, and that was it. So like no sleep, essentially. Yeah, it was that twilight zone. But yeah, I know what you're talking about, that late night competition with some stimulant leads to a long night on the night you really want to be able to recover and sleep yeah i got up and like ate macaroni and cheese at like 1 30 in the morning and like all by myself like jess is in bed i feel like a huge loser i didn't hit my goal time it's like the whole world's asleep and i'm eating macaroni and cheese (laughs) alone Mm -hmm. in a dark kitchen like what is wrong with me then you go lay in bed and your heart's just like do 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 just still racing like what what is wrong with me oh the joys why can't they have this race at lake (laughs) yeah uh, like one thirty in the morning, I tiptoed down the creaky wooden stairs because we were up on the second floor, and my legs are locked up so bad I can't be gentle on my, my legs. I'm mm-hmm. stiff legged, and I'm going down the stairs to eat leftover pizza. One thirty in the morning, heart rate's at like one thirty going down the stairs. It's the exact same thing. It's foolishness. Yeah, yeah but you do that at nine in the morning, non race days when right before we record this podcast. Not the heart rate and the the yeah leftover pizza but the cold sure. pizza yeah but same thing eating in the middle of the night <clears> unable <throat> to sleep heart rate racing stupid just staring at my positive splits yeah. on my phone <laughs> on the times be like look at that like eating mac and cheese <laughs> looking at positive splits the only person awake in the whole world it felt so like flagellating oh gosh now we can laugh right, about it so now. let's pivot yep. the episode is stain power is king. Yep. Hop up on a little soapbox here and preach at us. Okay. Um, if I did anything wrong, and I'm trying to shove aside the fact that I, I didn't feel great like the last 10 days leading in in the med, so let's just leave it out of the equation, okay? It wasn't my best day. I, last year, I felt better for both races that I hit. Then this was the worst feeling race of all three. So that aside. Okay. Um, if I had to go back and rejig the training, I had been on my soapbox about speed work on Tuesdays, high turnover work at race pace or faster, and then my threshold work uphill on the treadmill on Fridays. We talked about that, um, in the don't screw it up Mm -hmm. episode, I believe. Right. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, I think if it's anything longer than a 5K, even a 10K, half marathon, trail racing, I think that formula is bulletproof. What maybe I needed was a little more of that threshold efficiency work on flat terrain, maybe alternated weeks on that, giving myself some slower than race pace, but still like, you know, that's just efficient biomechanical, let's say 520 pace running. Or 5.30 Mm -hmm. pace running where I get in a threshold, I stay there, and I extend that over duration. I think in hindsight I needed more of that. Let's call it like run economy, we'll call it, at like the non-race pace. So I think that is part of it. Okay. I don't think I do it every week, but I think every other week I think I should have subbed it out. Um, And then the other thing is I got like – the stride felt so easy, Bracken, early. It felt so buttery smooth. It felt like nothing. It was nothing for me to run 71. We went out in 35 for the first 200, and it was like I was holding back, holding back. And then that 71, I was holding myself back, holding myself back. My legs were effortl- effortlessly moving. It wasn't an issue. That speed was so accessible, Bracken. It was laughable. It had nothing to do with that speed. But as soon as that heart rate stayed high long enough, 
and I was reduced to what my stay power was under those conditions, it wasn't good enough. It had nothing to do with my body's ability to biomechanically move through space fast. That I was overprepared on with what I did these last six weeks leading in. It was not a problem to run 448 pace. That felt like a damn joke until it didn't. And that whole thing until it didn't is the stay power thing. It has, I would have been better served running a bunch of workouts slower than race pace. Maybe I stick to my six by a mile with one to two minutes rest and I run them all in 510. How does that serve me for a 448 race? I don't even exactly know, but I know when I was in it, I felt like that's what I needed. I felt like I should have been doing 3K reps. I felt like I should have been doing some more ladder work that started with longer repeats. It felt like when you get into the heart of it, when that heart rate's been high enough for long enough, speed doesn't matter. It had nothing to do with my body's ability to turn over. It had the polar opposite to do with that. It had to do with what my aerobic capacity was, my ability to buffer lactate. And then once I bridged that, like where was my fitness reduced to? <laughs> Way slower than my intended pace. So the legs weren't the issue. The turnover was an issue. The biomechanical efficiency wasn't an issue. If I had to experiment with it, the bulk of it would be still flat threshold work. I just saw, did you see this interview with Jakob Ingebrigtsen after just breaking the 3K world record this weekend? No. I wish I could play the audio for the folks, but I just I watched don't the think race, but I did not see the interview. Well, there's a couple of snippets from his interviews, you know, circling the interwebs. And, and all mm -hmm. he said was, I knew I was fit and I knew I was capable, but I didn't know how fast I could do this. I didn't know how fast I could go. He's like, I, I don't all out train or run in training. I had no idea what my ceiling was. Like I save it for race day. So I didn't know where that would land me because I never run all out in training. The guy runs probably slower. Most of his workouts are slower than the average pace he ran for that 3K, which is like 58 second per lap pace, which makes me sick. Mm hmm what he does is efficiency work that might be short in duration, but like when it comes to his thousand meter reps, he's running way slower than that. He's even running quarters way slower than that, even in the bulk of his training season. But he's just constantly just threshold, 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 threshold. Then he gets efficient by what? Ripping some 200s as an end cap to a, to a workout. But those don't really hurt. They just help with the efficiency. And so what I'm getting at is I think the staple – potentially if I were to experiment would be like even those track Tuesdays where I was ripping damn it maybe they should be threshold sessions just finished with a little bit of an end cap of efficiency work or a midweek long run on a Thursday where I end with four by 400 meters at race pace and seeing how that plays itself out because I believe stay power is king I think the best in the sport understand that and I think I'm like somewhere in the abyss between like being older and needing efficiency work or feeling like, Hey, I'm getting older. Don't lose your fast twitch, which is what I focused on, but I'm not sure still even at 41, that's the right formula. And so do you get how I'm like trying to read potentially yes. like, look at this and rejig the system. What do you make of that? Yeah. Well, first of all, you're, you are correct. You are right on this, but in what regard, my, my gut reaction in that, yes, you you need staying power more than you need efficiency once you have efficiency. And I think that's the, mm -hmm. the key piece here is that you came off a half marathon and you had to get ready for the demands <clears throat> of a 5K. And so you had to go in because you can't maintain something that isn't established. So from that, I'm not saying you part in particular, but kind of. Sure. Like you can't minimum effective dose speed work and get better at it. Right. You had to do the type of training you did to get to the point where 71s felt like you were holding back. But now you have that. And for the next block, I believe that you absolutely have earned the right to dose that type of overspeed work. Hold on to what you've had and put now the vast majority of your training into race pace or slightly slower. You don't have to do the faster than because you've earned that. But I think it had to be earned. Hmm. So you were... 
you, I mean, this is the conversation of someone who didn't have enough time to do both. You did a half marathon. Now you had a 5K. It probably wasn't going to pair up perfectly, but now the next one can. Now you have right. time because you've freed up time in your schedule by getting ahead of the efficiency curve. So I agree with you wholeheartedly, but I don't think you wasted your time with this one. Hmm. I think you sacrificed this race for the next one in hindsight. It's a good take. Look at you with your wisdom. Sometimes you're sometimes you're too close to it. Like I think as an athlete, um, you know, you hear like race recaps from athletes you coach or workout recaps or you have conversations about how things are going. And sometimes yeah. like people are just too close to it to really see the big picture. And that's something I would have never thought mm-hmm. about probably just because you're so you're too close to the flame to see the whole fire. Right. Like it's just like always. Mm-hmm. We're always the last person to see it in ourselves. Why is that? That's stupid. But you're not wrong. Stay power is king. And now you get to go in on that. Mm -hmm. So you're in a privileged place now where you don't have to do a lot of work on it because you're not far off. And you also don't have to do a lot of work on the speed because you've shorn that up. So you get to get back to doing what you like to do and what you preach without fear that you won't be efficient enough for the 5K. Yeah, that's fair. Now I could go into more grindy sessions with little finishers to keep what I've earned, so to speak. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, your finishers will keep you in touch with what you've done. Do you know what, though, is that I think, like, let's just say generically, if it was my day, I still think I I could have done it. Let's say it was 10 degrees cooler and I felt my best. Mm -hmm. All excuses aside, I think I still don't think it's a fool's errand. And that's what's irking me is I think, like, I think that was the worst result I could have put out. And I don't mean to poo poo like a fifteen twenty six. I feel like I like really messed it up kind of in a sense with given the circumstances. And so that's I think that's what gnaws at me more than anything is I just didn't go out and nail it and I'm not used to that. So you gotta write yeah. your wrongs, I guess. Well you're also playing in the margins. Like your your story has been written appropriately. You're playing in the margins now. You're 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 mm-hmm. fiddling with things, and so it's not a. Like, after a race, it's black or white, but it's not. It's very gray, and you're in the gray. You mm. could do it again in two weeks and maybe do it, but you up your chances by shoring up your staying power. You've already taken care of the efficiency piece, where it's not like you. You didn't miss by a half minute of real time. You know, you didn't miss by 26 seconds of real time. You missed by 13 seconds of real time and 13 seconds of bleeding out done with your nose in the fight. Those are yeah. very two, two very different results. If someone nails their race and misses by 26 seconds, it was an inappropriate <clears throat> goal for their current fitness. Sure. If you make it a mile and a half and you start to fade, well, everything that happens once you bleed <laughs> doesn't matter anymore. You know that mm. you were six laps away from getting it. And maybe temperature changes four of those. And being in the fight is the last two. So you're in the margins. Hmm. On the very outside of the margins, but but in the margins. I, I would do agree with you there. Right. And yeah. that's where the subtle change in how you are going to work your staying power takes you closer to the main, to the main goal. I don't know where I'm going to rip again. That's sort of the issue is I start to – this was sort of ceremoniously the – the last swing at something and then I'm going to be basically buried, you know, miles deep in the woods in the fall. And I, I have other passions that I love. Right. And so it's, do I want to keep pushing and find something, but if I do it, I want it to be USATF certified, ideally a track. It could be a road race only if it's certified, but I don't know. And then Jack sent me, um, the Valentine's invite in February were like, like, I don't know how many 40 some collegians or 70 some collegians broke four in the mile and you can enter unattached and they have waves all weekend. He's like, just dude, wait till February, go run it indoors in good conditions and it'll be done. So I'm like, do I do that? Do I really chase that pursuit that hard? Do I suck it up and find balance this fall instead of being in the woods all the time and like, getting another race under my belt. So I can't really decide. Like, I don't have the next opportunity is what I'm saying on my schedule. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give... Last year at this point, we gave several different options for your off season. Mm-hmm. 
go towards the marathon, go to, go towards hybrid, retool and go towards spring. And I'm going to echo one of the things I said last one year ago, probably to the day. Okay. And that is, if you want to set this up for your best chance of doing this, you go find your balance this fall, run your volume, do your fun uphill workouts, have purpose to your threshold work all winter, run two indoor meets, and then find your perfect outdoor meet and go after it early spring. Mm. That's that's the way it's set up for success. You're going to have a lot of people, a lot of meets, whereas right now, if you miss in this one, like there isn't a second chance, and maybe there's one. If you run 15, 20 indoors, you're like, okay, I can run 15, 10 next week, and two weeks later, there's another meet, and three weeks later, there's another meet. Right. There are so many options that it takes pressure off of any one single chance. So I still think that's the best option is to follow the actual track season if you want to crack at it and another crack and another crack. Mm. And you find the day and the temperature and the pacing. But does that fit with your timetable? I don't know. It does. That fits very well with my timetable. Go go maintain fitness and and pursue other passions and hobbies, which I have outside of this, and then circle back and get it done when I can put my full focus on it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And do it in a way where temperature and opportunities align. Yeah. Again, when you're in the margins, you want as many controllables controlled as possible. Mm -hmm. This is twice in a row now, three times technically in a row, you've just slammed your head into the same door. I mean, it wasn't as it wasn't nearly as bad this year, but it was still. Once you got two laps into the race, it was overwhelmingly hot again. It was just very interesting. Um, I'm trying to think back, like when I was in college. You know, we would chase the auto qualifiers, or the provisional qualifiers in to make the national meet. You know, I pursued it in the 1500. I made it my freshman and sophomore years. And got sick and didn't make it the rest of my college career. But I remember I'm trying to think back to the nuances of that. And you experienced the same thing with the eight, right? You were knocking on the door of qualifying for mm-hmm. nationals. And I don't believe you did, right? But it had to be. Nope, never it, did. It had to be little Q, you know, qualifier on your mind constantly. Do you remember playing that song and dance yeah. with, I mean, the eight is very different than the 5K, but. Breaking it down is no different in the sense is where do I go out for my first 200? How do I follow up the back half of the first lap? Where do I finish? Do you remember playing this song and dance? Did you experiment with it at all? Do you remember how it panned out? Yeah, I ran my final three races in my college career were in six days, maybe five days. Oh. I ran three 800s and roughly five days and were I you running, three straight times and three totally different races. Were you running night races under the, like pretty much like all in the middle end of May? Yeah. Huh. North Central yeah, College was, was probably running. I ran at like three in the afternoon. Two days later, it was 8 p.m. Two days later, it was 9 p.m. at North Central. It was like mm-hmm. lacrosse, whitewater, North Central. And I PR'd three times in three different races, but the, and I didn't make it. But the one I got closest to making was the same one, the same race style that everyone qualified up at lacrosse in the 1500 and that people qualified at North Central in the 5K. It was the right race style. Mm -hmm. And it was people didn't have to worry about what's my first 200, my next four, when do I go? They just all of the pack got clicked into the same goal in the right conditions. It was just Mm -hmm. a cool, crisp night. And there was a line of people all working for the same goal, and they just rolled together. And with a lap to go, everyone was pumped up because they all knew, like, if we just close, we make it. And that's how the 800 was, and I mm-hmm. I made a tactical error in mine. But the, the heat ahead of me had, like, four last-minute qualifiers out of it. And it was just when you're the one making the pace decisions, if you're not world-class talent and mental setup, it's really hard to – to nail it when you're close to it being possible or not. But when you had like 10 people sharing that, that's the one. And that's why I think track season is so important to hit it in because you get to control the weather and you get to be in a race without such a big spread of ability. You're not going to get 1340 through, through 1540 in one race. You're going to get 1501 through 1511. You're going to have 20 people in that range. And then you're not making decisions 
you're just running in a group where everyone's the same. Mm -hmm. Those are exciting days. I took one of my last swings at uh, 1500 outdoors my sophomore year um, and died trying there too now that I think about it. I'd run like 354 outdoors, but it took about 352 to get in that year. And we were running 350 pace. And I think my last 200 I ran in like 35 seconds. <laughs> Started doing that math. Yeah, I remember fading in that one too. But that's where you're at yeah. at that point in the season. Like it's the same thing as chasing goals. Like you listening, like I want to break 20 in the 5K. I had an athlete there, Peter, who was chasing 20 minutes in the 5K at the same race I was at. And he went out and ran his heart out and ran 2025 because he faded home and that is what it is when you're chasing a specific goal or a qualifying standard in college mm -hmm. you kind of die trying like you don't you don't have options right and when you put a number like 15 flat or those of you chasing times in your local road 5k like you don't often do it negative splitting you rarely often do it even splitting and the guaranteed way is to roll the dice, show up, overshoot slightly early, and hope that it's one of your good days that you will always remember, in which you hang on and cross where you want to. I don't know if there's another way to do it unless you're like a Jakob Ingebrigtsen racing competition who isn't as good as you, and your only goal, only in quotes, is to win, and you can hold back and run within yourself until it's time to win. But if you're chasing metrics like mm -hmm. that, I don't know how else you approach it. And the 5K and under in particular, probably the 10K and under, I don't know. Where would you draw your limit there? Is like you need to go out on pace or faster in order to run your best. 5K, would you extend it to 10K? I don't know. Maybe. That, that middle distance, and I extend 5K to middle distance yeah. for most people. It's it's tricky. Like my PR was 502. Two five oh three through the mile, five oh eight in my second one, mm. and then four fifty one to close. Jeez. Those are outrageous splits. That's not ideal. That was just getting I got on tilt the last mile <laughs> and closed like crazy. But that wasn't set up for success. Mm -hmm. But likewise, going out five oh eight reverse, then five oh two, four fifty one wasn't a possibility. Whereas in a world class field, you might be able to go right on, right on, blast something crazy. Most people don't have the genetic makeup to be able to work that hard under that much duress. So I think the best way to PR is to not have to look at the watch. Probably. I truly believe that every ounce of mental effort needed to look at your watch and either confirm or deny how you're feeling is a negative in your bank account. That getting on a race field and racing more often than not, is the PR way that everyone other than the winner gets it. <laughs> the winner might be looking around, checking it, but the people who get pulled along for a while and then close with a burst of adrenaline, those are the ones that have the easiest mental route because the only thought is race. Don't let them go. Yeah. But every time you, I look at my watch during a race, every race I've ever run trying to run pace, it stops feeling like a race. And it feels more like an execution of a of a plan. And the logic that goes along with that flies in the face of the hurt and the emotions of racing. Yeah, you're speaking some pretty uh, firm truths. Um, a lot of videos I didn't share. I made a post last night on Instagram about falling short. But um, I had a whole slew of videos from... Jess and then friends TJ and Kelly sent videos okay. and my buddy Peter was there an athlete I coach Alyssa was there I have all these this stuff from the race and you know what Jess was at the start line of the race which is on the back side of the track where nobody is really right everybody's in that home stretch but where you start is on the opposite side of the finish line and so Jess has videos of me pretty much every lap and guess whose stupid butt is looking at his watch and doing math every single lap mm -hmm. me and you're probably right. Like the guys up front I was watching, they weren't even wearing watches. A lot of those guys, like some of those in the front. And the winner ran like 1420 or 1422. Um, not not paying attention at all. Didn't matter. I ran by feel. I think there's something to that. Um, I don't know if I'm yeah. quite there, though. It's one of the beauties of wave light. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. It, but it's one. that's the difference in, in the, the pace pack that I'm talking about. Outdoor twilight race 
with a two minute spread in the field versus a, versus a race where everyone's seated within 20 seconds of each other is that takes the pacing mentality out of it. You don't have to think, you know, the race is going to be run in this tight window anyways, because this is what we're all here to run. Whereas last on Friday, everyone was here to run a different time. There's right. even a pacer in the group because they didn't know what the whole group was going to run. So uh, yeah, you may not be there in a 30 person field with a two minute spread and you might be right there in an 11 person field with a 20 second spread. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just to bring this back full circle and then we'll wrap this thing up, uh, is the conversation of stay power is king. Um, I'm being a little bit exaggeratory, but I, in saying stay power is all that matters. And if you have to make yeah. decisions and waffle over what workout should I do today or how long should my long run be, or should I do 400 meter repeats or one K repeats? I don't know. What should I do? I would challenge you listening to always choose the less sexy and the longer. Should I do three by two miles or should I do a six mile tempo? Well, six mile mm-hmm. tempo sounds boring. Same distance as three by two miles. And again, I'm being a little bit on the far side of this and ex- and explaining it, but I that's how I felt after this is Longer is better, grindier is yeah. better, less rest between reps is better, and longer intervals or extended threshold work is better. And I'm not reinventing the wheel by by saying these things. And you're right, I earned the speed and I needed to earn the speed, but I still think you're reduced down to that type of running in a race as long as a 5K. And if you have to hedge your bets and you yes. have to make training decisions... I think the grindier, the better, and the longer, the better, and the less rest, the better. Even if what you're training at isn't at your intended goal pace. If it's slower, that's okay. Listen to Jakob Ingebrigtsen. Let me echo his words about I don't go all out. I didn't know how fast I could run because I don't run this fast, especially for this long. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm stealing some knowledge that other people have curated over time, but... I don't know if you had any any other thoughts on that, just as like sort of an end cap to the conversation, but those are mine. I'll echo it with my own experience, which is slower than yours, but my 5K PR is 5.02 pace. Okay. And that year I ran that on June 2nd, I want to say, and it was hot Mm -hmm. and it wasn't ideal, but I had not. Now I had done strides and hill sprints, but I hadn't run longer than 20 seconds at any pace faster than race pace that calendar year. In the five weeks leading up to it, I hadn't run a single rep, 800 meters or longer, faster than 520 pace. And I averaged 502 in the race. So it's entirely possible to run faster than your training paces by building up your system. And that's what you're talking about. But I I am an example of one that I did not touch 5K race pace. I did sprints faster, five to 20 seconds long, And I did a lot of 1500 meter reps that spring at 520 to 525 pace. And I did a few cross country course reps. Maybe the one thing I did is Macaulay and I ran that week. We did two mile, one mile, 800, 800 on the cross country course. And we came through, I want to say 1040 through the two mile. So 520 pace on grass. That's probably worth like 512. So that was probably the single fastest thing I ran. And that was two days prior to the race because I didn't know I was racing. So let's say 512 pace and my my miles were 502, 508-ish and then 451. So even that didn't touch race pace. So it's entirely mm-hmm. possible to shore up your weaknesses without touching race pace. Yeah, that's a good example of that. You're, you're always reduced to your stay power and what is your stay power. And... Try not mm-hmm. to let something fast erode what got you there, meaning don't let go of your foundation for the flashy hot girl with no personality. You know, it might be fun when you're at the track ripping twos, right? I felt real good about myself running 28s and 29s on the track for 200s. But did that really translate to my average pacing of 73 or 74 seconds? per quarter mile in the 5k like let's real talk ourselves bracken it didn't 
I didn't need those. Didn't need those at all. I don't think they translated. And so that's my big takeaway. Don't chase the flashy hot girl. Chase the average looking girl with substance. And that is your long grindy <laughs> wow. threshold work. What? Why are you, why are you smiling? That's going to make people happy to hear. <laughs> what do you mean? Like average girls with substance, they're going to be happy to hear it? Is that what you're saying? I think what you're saying is that uh, people who are married to someone, maybe say you, are going to hear I'm average looking with average personality. <laughs> she knows that's not true. She's beautiful. I got lucky. I got it all. And so did you, right, Bracken? Which is why I'm not agreeing with your statement. <laughs> All right. Uh, put my foot in my mouth once. Um, anything else we should add to this? I really appreciate uh, it's a dumb 5K. That means absolutely nothing in the grand scheme of things. And every person I work with is asking me how it went and good luck and people sending messages over a freaking 5K. And I guess that's what comes with stating your goals publicly. But um, the support, oh, feeling pretty loved over a stupid track 5K. So thank you for those who you know sent messages, asked me how it went, all that stuff. Bracken never asked me how it went until this conversation, but you guys, you guys. I called you, Kirk. I called you, you that night. You did? No, you didn't. Check your phone. Check right now. Check your missed calls from the past three days. On Friday night? No, I got nothing. I wish you could see this. I got nothing. Check Saturday morning then. Check Saturday morning. You call, so you're, no, I, you're lying to me. So you called me yesterday at 7.02 p.m. And then the last Correct. time we. that was we, the second time I called you And this the weekend. last time we chatted on the phone as I scroll through was August 15th at 12.37 p.m. No. So you're, you living, you're living in delusion. No, I never got a call from you. It's okay. It's okay, Bracken. Well, then, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Did you just look at your phone records and it confirms that you didn't call me Friday night? <laughs> yeah, so I called you. It was Saturday morning. I called you on the way to the store to say, hey, we're having trouble with the, the editing software and I want to hear about your race. And it went straight to voicemail. I oh. swear to you. Hmm, and now I'm seeing that we don't have a connected call. It's okay. I love you anyways. All right, we're going to end this thing. I hope that you guys listening got something out of it and can apply it to your training. Uh, and if anybody out there is racing 5Ks, uh, whether it goes well, poorly, or somewhere in the middle, like reach out. Let us know how you feel your training paid off in relation to how you felt out there on course. Um, Bracken and I both feel like we have a good handle on training and stimulus and adaptation, but we're still experimenting. So... I'd like to hear people's feedback on their takes on maybe some of their 5Ks and how their training did or did not come through. That's all I'll end. Anything else? Thanks for supporting my man, <laughs> Running Public. Thank you very much. Yeah. Made up for Brack and Slack. We'll catch you guys later this week. <laughs> <laughs>